Okay, so I'll freely admit that the last episode was pretty dry, but you'll be glad to know that I'm actually going to talk about some railway and permanent way concepts in actual detail this time. I promise. So, let's talk about straights and curves. The ideal track alignment is a straight line. It's as simple as that. The reason for that is because it's easy to install, it's easy to maintain, it is energy efficient because trains don't have to accelerate and brake, it's also rarely possible when constructing new railway lines, let alone upgrading existing lines. And thus, the horizontal alignment of track is normally formed of straights and of curves. Straight elements are defined by a bearing, or an angle, and a length, whilst curves are defined by their radius and length. The smaller the radius, the tighter the curve. Conversely, the larger the radius, the shallower the curve. The trouble is, curves result in unbalanced forces which can reduce passenger comfort and damage goods, as well as increasing maintenance requirements for the track. They also result in lateral forces being transmitted into supporting structures. By that I mean bridges and that sort of thing. In extreme cases, there's a risk of vehicle derailment or overturning through poorly designed, installed or maintained curves. To reduce curving forces, engineers can do one or more of three things. Firstly, we can maximise the curve radius where possible. So what I mean by that is, get the railway alignment as close to being as straight as possible. So as shallow a curve as possible reduces curving forces. Uh, though this can obviously be challenging in constrained geography. The next thing we can do is reduce train speeds. Though clearly this is not preferable for maximising energy efficiency or minimising journey times. The third thing we can do is what's called apply cant. What I mean by that is we can lift the outer rail above the inner rail through the curve. Before talking a bit more about cant, it's worth pointing out that cant is different to tilt or inclination. Tilting trains are specially designed to reduce lateral forces on the track and reduce the impact on passengers of going faster around curves. Inclination is where the two rails are angled towards each other on the track to improve the interface between the wheel and the rail. So when going around a curve, a train generates an unbalanced outward force on the track. Engineers resolve or choose not to resolve these unbalanced forces using super elevation, which is more commonly known as cross level or cant. This is where one rail is raised above the other rail. The cant required to balance inwards and outward forces is known as equilibrium cant. As not all trains travel through curves at top speed, you know, such as freight trains or uh, trains slowing for a signal or trains stopping at stations, uh, it's usual to apply less than equilibrium cant, and the difference between equilibrium and applied cant is called cant deficiency. Thanks to Newton's second law of motion, i.e. that force is equal to a mass times its acceleration, we can look at the unbalanced forces through a curve as accelerations. By doing this, the resulting equations for applying cant become independent of train mass, which is good because calculating the mass of every single train that potentially will run through an alignment is a pain in the backside. The equations of lateral acceleration are easily derived using rotational acceleration and the horizontal component of the train's weight as it tilts over. The outwards acceleration due to centrifugal forces is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius of the curve. Similarly, the inwards acceleration resulting from the train leaning over through the curve is equal to cant times acceleration due to gravity divided by the track gauge uh, measured across the rail centres. If we play with the variables you can kind of see how this works. So if radius increases, or speed decreases, the outwards acceleration decreases. Similarly, if the cant decreases, or the distance between the rails increases, the inwards acceleration will decrease. If equilibrium cant, which is the sum of applied cant and cant deficiency, is where the inwards and outwards accelerations are balanced, we can make these two equations equal to each other. And that gives us the equation of cant. E plus D is equal to K V squared over R. Now K is a constant. So that is where we smoosh uh, the track gauge and the acceleration due to gravity, so a railway will behave differently on the moon than it would on Jupiter, and also a factor to, to account for changing between metres per second and uh, kilometres an hour. Um, so for the UK standard gauge track, we use this constant of 11.82. So when I'm calculating how tight a curve can be for a given speed, or what cant I need to apply on a given curve, or what the resulting cant deficiency is, I will use the equation E plus D is equal to 11.82 V squared over R. E is the applied cant in millimetres, D is the cant deficiency again in millimetres, V is the train speed in kilometres an hour, 
and r is the curve radius in metres. It's actually a really easy equation, honest. Applied can is primarily limited by passenger comfort, but if there's a large difference in train speeds on the line, then there's a risk of significant uneven loading of the rails. Cant is normally limited to 150 millimetres. Cant deficiency, which is basically a measure of how much force engineers have decided not to balance out, uh, is limited by the lateral resilience of the track and the strength of the track components. So by that I mean how much your track geometry holds itself in place, and also if you're going to break a load of clips by putting a load of too much force through the rails. High cant deficiencies can result in excessive high rail wear and degraded track geometry. Low cant deficiencies can result in low rail damage, and they can also impact on the track support, so they can actually damage the formation underneath. The ratio of applied cant to cant deficiency can make a significant difference to the damage uh, on the high and low rail under traffic. 100% E to D, if you like, or a ratio of kind of 50-50 cant to cant efficiency is a good starting place for a multimodal railway line. Now, City Skylines doesn't actually model cant. As you can see by the track here, the rails are flat. However, it does show the trains tilting over, so basically they've come up with a compromise that's easier from a kind of a CAD model perspective uh, and an art perspective, but the trains do tilt over based on the speed they go through a curve. Bearing that in mind, and considering everything we've just discussed regarding cant, cant efficiency, curvature and all that good stuff, um, I thought I'd actually use City Skylines to do some visualisation. Uh, so here's me uh, mucking around, um, creating lots of a, a, a sort of series of radii, a series of different radii, to show you what different curves are required for different speeds. So um, just finished drawing this up. So let's see what we've got here. First off, two curves. The first is, a, I think, a 20 meter radius curve, and the second is a 40 meter radius curve. You can see they are good, basically, for tram lines. Uh, nothing more than that, and really low speed, so five and 10 miles an hour. So for the next curve, with a radius of 100 meters, you can see I've moved from tram lines to metro lines. That's because for certain metro systems, you might well see radii down to this sort of sharpness, curves that are this tight. Um, and you can see you get 25 miles an hour out of it with about 100 millimeters of cant, and that gives you your, your deficiency of 92 millimeters and an E to D ratio of 92%. I haven't applied maximum cant here. For a tight curve like this, if you apply maximum cant, you're going to get horrendous low rail damage, so rolling contact fatigue, shelling, uh, not to mention damage to the formation underneath as well. So ideally, for a curve like this, you'd reduce the speed and you'd have flat cant. In fact, under 40 miles an hour, really, you don't want to be applying cant because you end up damaging the track. Chances are things are going through there slower anyway, so you really do compound the track damage. So you see the next curve here has a radius of 200 meters, and that gets up to 35 miles an hour. Again, you can see it's pretty tight. Next up, you have a radius of 300 meters, which gets you 45 miles an hour. Uh, again, this is too tight, really, for heavy rail, but metro systems can... You'll, you'll see curvatures of this pretty frequently, certainly in urban areas. Right, we've finally got onto heavy rail. We're now onto a radius of 400 meters. You can see this allows us a speed of 55 miles an hour if we apply maximum cant. So I'm now changing from applying 100 millimeters of cant to applying maximum cant for this curvature. So at maximum cant, uh, you can see the deficiency you get is 82 millimeters. Actually, you've got quite a low E to D ratio here, 55%. So from 400 meters, we're going to skip up to 700 meters. With maximum cant, this radius allows you to run 75 mile an hour trains. You can see it's starting to slacken off. The curvature is not so obvious. You see, comparing it to the others, it's, it's, it's pretty big. So if we skip up to a radius of 1,000 metres, we're starting to get to the point where I'd, I'd call this a shallower curve. It's not a flat curve, it's not a really shallow curve, but it is, it's certainly, sh I wouldn't call this a tight curve. For a 1,000 metre radius curve, you can start running speeds of up to 90 miles an hour with maximum cant applied. Jump up to 1,200 metres and you've broken the time, you're at 100 miles an hour. I'll just point out that with maximum cant applied, you're really pushing the maintenance uh, requirements for the track. So up to a radius of 1,500 metres, we can get to 110 miles an hour. Things are speeding up. So then if we jump now to 1,900 metres, 1,900 metres, you can get to 125 miles an hour with maximum cant applied. And indeed in the UK, you will find parts of the network that are around about the 1,900 to 2,000 metre radius mark with maximum cant applied. South of Doncaster is a good example. There's 125 mile an hour speed uh, and the curvature is right at the top of the limit. In fact, the cant has increased beyond its kind of allowable limit to 160 millimeters in places. You're really pushing everything kind of to, to its limit at that point to get that speed. 
the forces involved are pretty impressive. So if I draw a straight here, this just allows us to sort of see how much the curve, you know, compared to a straight track, what the curvature looks like. And you can see over about 100 meters, you're, you stop being able to notice the curvature that much. Really, you're, you are starting to get up to quite a flat bit of track and it's still only allowing you 125 miles an hour with maximum cant, which indicates how flat a curve you need to really get those high speeds. So that really gives us our range of curve radii for a conventional rail. So that's going from right down to you know 20 meters, 40 meters, 100 meters, up to kind of up to 400 meters really, which covers all your sort of urban systems. Um, then you're onto heavy rail, so 400 meters up to around about you know 1900, 2000 meters, that gets you up to 125 miles an hour. Anything above the 200 kilometer an hour mark, so that's 125 miles an hour, and we're starting to talk about high speed rail. So now we're just going to look at the curvature values required with maximum cant to give you a series of different high speed rail maximums. So for example. 3,100 meters gives you 160 miles an hour with maximum cant applied. You can see this is pretty flat. To get 300 kilometers an hour, so there you are, 186 miles an hour, you need to go up to 4,200 meters with maximum cant applied. Incidentally, the text that I've um, entered in here, you can see, is the annotation that I'll generally use on drawings. So you can see you've got the track radius, you've got the allowable speed, uh, you've got the cant, so E for super elevation, D for cant efficiency, and then the E to D ratio. So if I just quickly draw a straight here, you can see that for about 100, even 200 meters, you can hardly tell the track is curved in city skylines. So onto the next curve, see there's a big gap now, uh, and we're looking at 225 miles an hour, that's 360 kilometers an hour, which is high speed two's maximum speed. The tightest curve using the maximum cant gives a radius of 6,300 meters, that's incredibly flat. So from 360 kilometers an hour, we're hopping up to 400 kilometers an hour. That's 250 miles an hour. And the track radius you require with maximum cant is 7,700 meters. This is flat track. So for the next curve, I thought I'd do something different. So far, we've been maximizing speed by applying the maximum cant that we can. This time, I thought I'd look at using zero cant, which is really the optimum situation for track in terms of maintainability. For a 10,000 meter radius curve, that's 10 kilometers, you can get 186 miles an hour out of it with no cant. The thing is, at radii this high, certainly 10,000 meters and above, it starts getting tricky to install and maintain it, certainly for ballasted track. And that's where slab track becomes very useful. But I'll talk about that in another video, I think. If I just draw straight, you can see that it takes ages before there's any difference in the kind of the distance from two. They just look straight. When you look at them next to each other, they look straight. So there you go. All those curves, you can see the scale of those curves. Absolutely massive curvature, uh, right the way down to tiny curvature. Hopefully I'll give you an idea of the speeds that you can get out of them. Using City Skylines is a bit of a visualizing tool. This is kind of what I was hoping this series would end up doing. Using City Skylines to kind of make some interesting P-Way points. Uh, hopefully you didn't mind me chucking in some maths, but I won't apologize because maths is good. Uh, next time, we will briefly be talking about horizontal transitions and the fact that City Skylines doesn't really do them. And you'll be glad to know that we will actually start sinking our teeth into a map and we'll start drawing some railways uh, and making railways that vaguely look realistic, hopefully. Anyway, all that remains for me to say is cheerio and see you next time, Friday at 6. Bye now, bye cheerio.